All right, let's open our Bibles to uh, the book of Nehemiah. And we finished chapter 4 last week, but I was looking at it and I felt really impressed to um, stay here at least one more week and look at um, one thing that happens at the end of the chapter. We talked about it last week briefly um, and, and covered it, but I'd like to spend our time tonight looking at this one aspect of the defense. It was when the group joined together, there was the conspiracy, verse 7. Um, it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites, so a whole conglomeration, a United Nations effort against Israel to, uh, to destroy them. It says they, they were angry, they, were, they seen the gaps were being closed, they became very angry. Verse 8, they all conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. And then we've, we've spent a lot of time here, so this is all familiar to you. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. Because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Judah came and said, the strength of the laborers is failing. There's so much rubbish, we're not able to build the wall. The adversaries said they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. And then also, so it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came, they told us ten times, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. So from within, from without, there's the threat of danger, the surrounding by the enemies. This is a very intense time. And so Nehemiah's response, they prayed, they'd set the watch, and now more specifically, verse 13, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings. I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. I looked and I arose and I said to the nobles and to the leaders and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on, half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, and the bows, and wore armor. The leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, and with the other they held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And then I said to the nobles and the rulers and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we're separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there, our God will fight for us. So we labored in the work. Half the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. Last week we focused on that balance, perfect balance. He tells them to fight, and then he says, God will fight for us. And in that, that exhortation, there's the encouragement to come to support each other. Verse 19, and we talked about it, but I want to spend the time tonight looking at verses 19 and 20, where he says, the work is great, it's extensive, we're separated far from one another on the wall, and wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Blow the trumpet. The idea that when you're in trouble, sound the alarm, call for help, ask for uh, your brothers to come to your aid, ask for those that are that are distance from you to come and help. That's going to require humility. Um, you know, you don't want to be the one that's blowing the trumpet and they come and they go, what's going on? Like, well, the ice cream man was going by and I was kind of afraid. Will you go get me a, a bomb pop? Like, dude, come on. It's not what the trumpet's for. But when the enemy's coming, when they're breaching the wall, when you know, like, we can't take it, we can't handle it, um, for real, blow the trumpet, call for help. Now, what's interesting about this issue is, is the support that's supposed to happen in the process of doing the work. They're building and they're battling, but one of their great defenses is their connectedness to each other. They're related to each other. They're from the same family. They're from the same father. Abraham is their father, and Isaac and Jacob. 
They're the descendants of Israel. They're the people of God. They're bound by covenant. They're in a covenant relationship with God. They're, they're bound by blood. They're, they're blood brothers. They're cousins. They're connected to each other by their birth, but also spiritually. And so that strength that they would have is in their, their identity of being together. And, and I think that this is one of the strengths that God wants to have for his people at all times. The idea of, of battling and building and building and battling and the challenges that come and the, the necessary importance of being connected to other people, to have bonds of love, to be blood brothers, to be from the same father, to be cousins, to say, hey man, that's my family and, and I'm for them. And, and this is necessary and I think it's important because in verse 19, the separation that they have is necessary. Nehemiah doesn't say it as though it's wrong. He just states it as a fact. Verse 19, the work is great and it's extensive. Why? Well, it's a great city and it's extensive. <laughs> He's not saying, hey, it's wrong that we're all separated, focused on this, you're focused on that, you're building this part, I'm building this part, you're 100 meters away, I'm half a kilometer away, we're spread out. That's not wrong. That's the work they're doing. They've been assigned to all the different parts. It's a big city. It's a big project. The work is great. It's extensive. And I, I think that sometimes we, we can end up lonely or we can end up separated even doing something for the Lord. And so we have to pay careful attention to the exhortation here and cultivate and build these kind of relationships. Be intentional about it. Not, not be satisfied that they don't exist and say, well, hey, the work's extensive, it's great, I'm not connected to people, but I'm, I'm right here, I'm plugging away, and it'll be okay. Well, listen, if you blow the trumpet and nobody knows, because nobody has a relationship with you, then no one's going to hear the trumpet. <laughs> you don't have anyone's phone number to call, well, then you're going to be in trouble. So you, you, there, there, there's, it's extremely important to invest in relationships so that while you're doing something for the Lord, or as you're walking with the Lord, the, the necessity of the way the ministry works out or the way our lives sometimes unfold, it's not necessarily wrong to be completely plugged in in an area where you're charging and doing this amazing thing and God's working, and you're separated. That's kind of sometimes the way it is. I think if, you know, um, you decide you know what, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you start begging God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And God starts pouring out His Spirit upon you. And you're receiving power and open doors and God's using you in a certain way. And, and, you, and you're, you're, you're praying about these, these things that God's starting to unfold. And you, you're committed to it and you start putting a lot of energy into it. Well, that energy has to, you don't have unlimited energy, your unlimited time, it's, that time gets taken from something else. That energy gets taken from something else, and then that can kind of isolate you maybe. Whereas before, the time and energy were spent on these things, and now you're putting them into this, and there can be a, sort of a separation that will happen. These relationships, now there's less time and energy. Now my energy is being poured into this thing, and you can get separated. And that's not wrong, necessarily. Now this person, they're, they're hearing from the Lord, and they're putting their energy there, and you're putting your energy here, and all of a sudden, you're, you're pretty separate. You're on the wall. You're you're going for it. You're charging. You're walking on water. You said, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come. And he said, come on. And you jumped out of the boat, and you're, you're now walking in the impossible. But that commitment and that investment now, when you weren't doing that, you were spending that time and energy on other things, and now you can't, and now you're out here, and it, get, it gets lonely. You know, you can get separated. And I don't think Nehemiah said, hey, let's all come back and all work on the same part of the wall. And then we'll all work on the same part of the wall and we'll just, eat, we'll just work our way around. He's not saying that. He's not saying that it's wrong that you're on the wall separated. He divided them up and we did chapter 3. Everybody spread out. Him, him saying this, it's, it's very important because the, the Bible talks about uh, our, our ministry or the things we're doing for the Lord. It calls it a work of faith or a labor of love. Now what's the difference between labor and a labor of love? Oh, there's a big difference. Have you ever labored and it wasn't a labor of love? Oh, yeah, yeah. You ever had a labor of hatred? 
or you're just grinding your teeth and you're just thinking, oh, I can't believe they make me do that. Oh, you're just so frustrated. You ever been involved in a labor of love? The time goes by like that and there's so much joy and you're so excited and you go the extra mile and someone's confused by why you have such a good attitude or why you're so patient or how come you, you're just going, hey man, it's a labor of love, a labor of love. But when you're, when you're in a labor of love, you know, you can, you're, you're inve- you become super invested, a work of faith. You ever been involved in work? You ever been involved in a work of faith? Is there a difference between work and a work of faith? Yeah, a huge difference. A work of faith means you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing, <laughs> that you can't afford to do, that you don't have time to do, that you don't have the ability to do. Well, if you're doing a work of faith, you're leveraged. Now, you're you're way outside of your comfort zone in a work of faith. Somebody says, oh, how are you going to fund that next month? And you say, I don't know. It's a work of faith. I don't know how I'm going to fund it this month. I don't know how we're going to do this. Well, where are you going to get the people to do that? I don't know. These guys quit. This person moved. That person did this. I don't know what's going to happen. The Lord will take care of it. It's a work of faith. We're not trying to do something that doesn't require faith. We're trying to do something that requires great faith where we end up having to pray continually or we're going to (laughs) sink. It's going to take a miracle. So a work of faith, a labor of love. That kind of ministry, when you you start to invest yourself and you're committed to the Lord and what he's calling you to do, that when you're in a labor of love or a work of faith, it's going to, of necessity, get you separated. There's just no way around it. You pour yourself into something. And then the diversity of the body of Christ the uniqueness of all the individual members. We're not meant to be like each other. I mean, look around the room. This is a diverse group of people. We're not cookie cutters. If you look around the room, you say, these people are weird. I'm normal. I'm the normal, I'm the, I'm the mean, and everybody else is off the mean quite a bit, you know. I'm right down the middle. I'm the, I'm the prototype, you know, right average, you know, and that's, I'm the standard, and everybody falls on. Some of these guys are really far outliers. You know, they're way out there on the spectrum of things. Well, listen, hey, who's normal? Raise your hand if you're the normal one, and we, we all bounce off of you, and you're the one that sets the standard. There's nobody normal. Fernando was looking back. He wanted to go, Ooh, I want to see that person. Where's the normal guy? <laughs> I didn't know we had a normal person. So... The body of Christ is uniquely created by God to be incredibly diverse. The Holy Spirit divides to each part of the body all the gifts that he wants according to the mind of God, the plan of God. He divides the gifts severally to each one as he wills. We don't get to decide what gifts we have. Paul said, covet earnestly the best gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So apparently we're allowed to covet Thou shalt not covet except the best gifts. The Holy Spirit decides. So he, he's looking at this, at this group of people that make up the body of Christ in the world, and he he's just divides out the gifts. This person needs that. I'm going to use this person for this. And, and then he assembles the group of people together. I think it's interesting how Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. One of the, you need to have this verse memorized. It will help you tremendously in your life. It says, God has set the members in the body, every one of them, as it has pleased him. God sets the members in the body, every one of them, as it pleases him. So who decides where you get set in the body? You say, well, I don't like the music. I don't get set there. What if God sets you in a place and you don't like the music? Well, I'll just be the meanest person in that church. I'll complain every Sunday that I don't like the music. Well, If God sets the members in the body as it pleases him, well, then Jesus is truly the head of the church. So God has this plan, and he's placing people in different places, and he moves them here, and he moves them there, and he he brings one from here, and he brings them over there, and he brings this one here for a season, then he sends that one out, and he's doing this whole thing, and it's it's very fascinating. It's very interesting, and it's not something you could ever predict. Who besides Jesus would choose a tax collector and a zealot to be in the same group of 12 guys. The zealots want to kill the Romans. The tax collectors join the Romans to collect taxes from the Jews. 
You're not going to find two people in Israel in the first century who hate each other inherently at first glance with the deepest passion as a, as a tax collector and a zealot. And Jesus looking at the crowd going, hey, tax collector, you look awesome. And zealot, why don't you guys be roommates? We'll watch. <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll see who wakes up in the middle of the night, you know, with the pillow over the other guy's face. These guys hate each other. Jesus picks Peter and says, you're going to be the main guy. You're going to be the guy. You're going to be the main guy. And then he chooses Saul of Tarsus to be the apostle to the Gentiles. <laughs> a guy who's killing Christians. The most self-righteous, legalistic person Jesus could find on the earth is the one he sent out to minister to idol worshipers. It's, you think, well, Jesus, you need to go to a class on leadership. <laughs> You're, you just don't know how to pick leaders. You don't know how to pick servants. You don't know how to assemble a team. You don't know how to put this together. The, Peter and John were standing before the Sanhedrin after the lame man was healed, giving the defense, and the leaders of Israel were looking at them, and they were thinking, these guys are untrained. They're uneducated. But they said, these guys have been with Jesus. And they looked at the lame man who you know, is now healed, and they couldn't say anything. But when they looked at them and tried to make an assessment, the assessment was, this can't be happening. There's, <laughs> you guys can't do this. You're not qualified. So in, in just built into the nature of the work that Jesus is doing is incredible diversity. And in, 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 in incredible capitalizing on the uniqueness of each individual part of the body. He's doing a unique and diverse work. What he's doing here is different than what he's doing in our friends across the street at Sun Grove. It's a totally different ministry. Not to say that we're better than them. They're probably better than us. Listen, it's different. It's diverse. It's a different pastor. It's different people. It's a different emphasis. Are they Christians? Yeah. Do we love them? We love them. We support them. We believe in them. We pray for them. We're happy for them. When they moved in across the street, we were bummed. Oh, this is our side of town. Let's get some pellet guns, man. We'll start taking out the windows. Go over there at night, spray cans. Go home. Go back to Arcade Baptist. Do we say, do, what we do? You do that in the world. I didn't ever do that. Someone might do that. I never did that. Just totally diverse work. So the nature of the work built into it is something that's going to lead to us doing different things in different ways, and that can, that can create a separation. You know, maybe even two friends were together serving Paul and Barnabas. They go on the first missionary journey they get an idea to go on a second missionary journey, and they each have, want to make a different emphasis. And because they have a different emphasis, they, go, they separate. And Paul takes Silas, and he goes on the second missionary journey. And, and Barnabas has a heart to restore John Mark, and he takes John Mark, and he goes on a missionary journey. And they go to Cyprus, and they begin to minister. And John Mark comes back, you know, and, he, and Paul later on writes to Timothy and said, Hey, help John Mark. Help him on his way. He's profitable to me. You know, there's, there's a separation. Now Paul and Barnabas, they were together. Now they're doing two different things. The ministry's multiplied, but now they're spread out. They're, they're far apart on the wall. God's doing so many awesome and wonderful things, and because of that, we end up getting spread out. And I think that's good. We don't want to be in a holy huddle. We don't want to say, we have all the Christians in the whole world. We got them together in the same room, and we're not coming out. We've seen the way things are going in the world. We bought a giant room, and we just got all the Christians. We got them all out of China. We were able to get them from Africa. We got them from Europe and Eastern Europe, South America, you know, all over North America. We got this giant room, and it's big enough to hold all of us. It's like an ark, and, and it's fireproof, and we're all going to go in there. We got enough food, and we got guns, and we're just going to get all the Christians, and we're going to all go together, and then we're just going to rejoice that we're all together. There's a time when that's going to happen. That's called heaven. It's not going to happen on earth. On earth, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get sent out. The work is great. It's awesome. 
You're going to get separated. You're doing something here, and all of a sudden, someone that you raised up and discipled or was a close friend, then they go over there, and then you go over there, and you think, hey, man, <laughs> you're way over there on the wall. Like, yeah, we're charging. This thing, you can't believe what God's doing. And then this person's over here, and, well, it's awesome what God's doing, and then you're over here. So it, because of the nature of the work, it's imperative to develop relationships so that when you blow the trumpet, you have people that will come running. We've been sent out by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the solution to the fact that the work is great and it's extensive and we're all spread out, the solution is not, let's do a much smaller work so we can all stay together. Let's just bring everybody in and we'll just build this part of the wall and we'll all be together. That's not the solution. The solution is span out. Take your part. Do this unique and amazingly diverse thing. Do your role. Do it with all your might. But because of that now, he makes this statement. Listen, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, verse 20, rally to us there. Come, come running, assemble, gather. You hear the sound of the trumpet. You know that wherever that noise is coming from, there's trouble. So you, get, you stop what you're doing and you run and help your brothers. So part of the application tonight is when you're in trouble, blow the trumpet. It's, it's a difficult thing to do to admit that you need help. I think that culturally, probably uh, we're one of those cultures that uh, this is especially difficult for us. We're, we're a highly individualistic culture. We're not necessarily very group-minded. I, I mean, I, I've, been, I've been in different places, and I wouldn't even, I think I'm totally underselling it. We might be the most individualistic society that ever existed on the earth. For sure, by a long shot, on the planet today, the Americans are infinitely more individualistic than anybody else. No one comes close to us the way that we only think of ourselves, and that we're not really open to having help or to working together, and we're not open to helping. <laughs> we're just very individualistic in our, our whole way of thinking. And so I think for us, it's especially challenging to... Um, apply this verse, or I think a New Testament complement to this would be what, what James writes at the end of James. If you want to save your place in Nehemiah, turn over to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, giving encouragement about prayer and um, ministering to one another. James adds this at the end. Verse 13 uh, he says, is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Then he adds this more generally. That's true. You've got a sickness. Something's going on. Call for the elders. Have them come pray for you. But then he adds this, and I think this is extremely general. I don't think it's specifically related to the elders. Verse 16, confess your trespasses to the elders. Is that what he says? He says to one another. The word confess is an imperative. It's a command, and it's present tense, which would be, in effect, saying confess and confess and confess. Be confessing. In fact, uh, Phillips translates this phrase, you should get into the habit of admitting your sins to each other. That's a good translation. You should get into the habit of admitting your sins to one another. Why? <laughs> Why would I do that? I'm American. I don't admit my sins to myself. Confess your trespasses to one another. And then he adds this, and this is why you would confess. And pray for one another. The word pray has got the same grammatical form uh, as a verb that the word confess does. It's a present tense imperative. My little notation, and I'm not an expert in these things, but my little notation in my Bible software says it's a reciprocal. The idea is that there's this openness that you have for, to one another. Confess to one another. Pray for one another. This is something that should be taking place. You're on the wall of necessity. The nature of the way that Jesus is going to be working, you might find yourself separated. So you're going to have to work at 
confessing. You need to blow the trumpet. If you're going through something, you need to reach out to somebody. You need to, you need to be willing to humble yourself and say, I'm struggling. I'm not doing good. And you confess. Now listen, I think obviously you want to be wise. Don't say, well, who, who has, who's got the problem with slander in the church? I want to talk to them about what I'm going through. Or who's the gossip? You know, be wise. Don't, who, who, who's the brand new Christian? You know, the one who I can totally shipwreck by sharing what I'm going through. Obviously, you want to be wise. So I, don't, I want to just sort of eliminate that kind of straw man that gets built so quickly. Choose wisely, but listen, do you have anybody in your life that you can confess your sins to? Do you have any friends? Do you have anybody that you can... When you're spread out by nature of what God's doing, and it's not a bad thing, it's, it's the plan of God, you can't retreat. The, the answer is not retreat. The answer is hold your post, but blow the trumpet and say, man... Over here, <laughs> the enemy's coming over my wall. I think they just scalped me. I'm in trouble. They just took my weapons. They just robbed my storehouse. They, they took away my tools. They already came over the wall. They got me. I'm mortally wounded. Pray for me. Come and pray for me. I think that sometimes the enemy gets through. It's so important when you need help to blow the trumpet, to cry out for help before you get wiped out. You know, generally, when we blow the trumpet, it's with the last air in our lungs. <laughs> Knife in one eye, spear in the back, head chopped off. I mean, we're just wiped out. Then it's... <laughs> what was that? I think I heard something. Uh, that was... Uh, they were dying. And the trumpet went to the lips. Hey, that's a good thing. Better if you got one breath left, use it on the trumpet. Better still, before you get decapitated, blow the trumpet. Before the whole thing blows up, before you get wiped out, before you shipwreck, before you crash land, before you go up in flames, say, hey, everyone, I lost the left engine. <laughs> What do I do? Can someone help me? Can you come and rescue me? Can you get me out of this? Can you come and pray for me? Confess the present tense. Be confessing. It's something that should be happening. Pray for one another. And the promise. James says you'll be healed because the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So who should you be confessing to? Well, if the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, that gives you a clue about who you should be confessing to. A righteous person. Now, how do you get righteous? You get righteousness in Jesus Christ. So any person who's a born-again believer, who's got the righteousness of Christ, perfectly capable of coming alongside, and you blow the trumpet and say, hey, can you pray for me and help me? The enemy will be getting through sometimes, and so before we get wiped out, we need to um, signal the alarm. Now, there's another aspect here, and, and uh, we can look at it again in Nehemiah if you want to turn back there. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, so someone has to blow the trumpet, so that's part of the application. If you need to blow the trumpet, go for it. The flip side of that is when you hear the trumpet, you need to run. You need to be... You need to be intentional. You need to be committed. You need to be uh, listening. You need to be attentive. You need to be aware. You need to be thoughtful about these things. We have a responsibility to each other in the body of Christ that we do get spread out, and so we have to be looking for the signs. Was that a trumpet I heard? Did you, were you trying to not blow that trumpet? Uh, what trumpet? The one in your hand. Nothing in my hand. How about your other hand? Nothing in that hand either. I think I heard it. I think I saw you with a trumpet. You want to you be sensitive to somebody who is the enemy's making, you know, he's making a, a, a pushed assault to break through their wall. They've got a weak spot, and he's going to capitalize on it. And so you hear the trumpet, you need to be ready to run in support of someone else. Now, Jesus, I want to look at a bunch of verses related to this. Jesus taught us this very thing. Turn to John chapter 13. There's no mistaking this. There's no getting around it, and it's definitely the emphasis of Jesus um, and his word to us. By way of application, 
Obviously, we're to believe in Christ, but practically what comes out of our faith is love. John 13, this is the night before Jesus is crucified. These are parts of his, of his last words to his disciples. He says it very plainly a couple times in this section, but verses 34 and 35 of John 13. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Here's the standard. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. Here's what I want from you. I want you to love each other, and the measure is how much I love you. I want you to love each other the way that I loved you. Now, in this context, earlier in the chapter, he had washed their feet. He said, I give you an example. You need to take a position of serving one another. You need to be willing to humble yourselves before each other. You need to be willing to let somebody else be lifted up while you take the bottom place, where you go down and someone else goes up and you support and you serve and you, you minister to each other. You love each other the way I loved you. How did Jesus demonstrate his love for us? He died on the cross for us. He gave his life for us. Jesus calling his followers to love the way that he loves. That's the standard. So anything less than that, we're not meeting the standard. Now, I'm not saying this to beat myself up or to beat you up, but we just have to be honest. <laughs> the standard is the love of Jesus. When I don't measure up to that, then I've, I've fallen short of what God wanted to have for my life. Now, that would be true in my marriage. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. But not just my wife. Jesus said, love everybody like that. Love everyone. Love each other the way that I've loved you. In Nehemiah, we're looking at battle. We're looking at the people of God standing together, building and battling. They get spread out. And part of the defense mechanism, part of the strategy, and this is part of the body of Christ, we're committed to each other. It's greatly diverse ministry. You end up doing this. This person's doing that. You get spread out. So you have to love each other. You hear the trumpet. That means somebody else is getting hammered. Well, I ain't going over there. <laughs> it's going good on my part. I'm not gonna, if I go over there, they're going to shoot me. That means there's a bunch of dudes over there. They're trying to take someone's head off. I don't want to go over there. But love, if I love the way Jesus loves, then I'll self-sacrifice. I'll run. I'll run when I hear the trumpet. I'll run to the place where there's difficulty. I'll go there because my brother is there. My sister is there. They're getting overrun by the enemy. A weakness has been exploited, and the enemy's pressing in, and there's an obvious cry. I heard it. And so I'm going to go and I'm going to, I'm going to spend and be spent to try to help them. Jesus taught us that. He said this in verse 35. By this, by what? The way you love each other. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know what the world cannot mimic? It cannot mimic love. It can mimic glory. It can mimic joy. It can mimic peace. Right? You can get high. You can see a guy like, how can we not? Oh, dude, it's all right. Guy's just high. Like, is that peace? Well, it's a mimicking of peace. The world has all these false substitutes for all these things that, that come only from God. But you know what the world cannot even come close to mimicking is love. The world cannot produce self-sacrificing love. There's nothing like it. And you only find it in those places where God's doing something. And by this, by what? When people see that kind of love, when they see you loving each other, when they see you loving like that, they'll know that something is happening here. They'll know that you're my disciples. It'll be something that they'll find compelling Love one another. So when we're thinking in terms of, of putting an application on, blow the trumpet. If you're in trouble, blow the trumpet. But, but if you're not blowing the trumpet and you hear the sound of it, love. That's what we're talking about. I think Nehemiah's story is an example of what Jesus is talking about. Love somebody. Love somebody enough to help them. I want to look at three different places now in the New Testament that use the phrase one another. Jesus says, love one another Nehemiah is saying, blow the trumpet, come running when you hear the sound, come running. And I want to look at three different ways that we could kind of maybe fill out the definition 
of love one another. For, turn first to Romans. And these are going to maybe um, you know, be familiar to you, or I don't know, maybe not. Romans chapter 15 In the context, he's been talking about how we need to care for one another related to different opinions about uh, whether or not people should eat food offered to idols. And so a person who's weak in faith can't eat food. You know, they're, they're all uptight about it. So he says, you guys that are stronger in faith and you know it doesn't matter, you need to care for the weaker brother. He's all uptight. He can't eat that. You know, he's got all these rules. Just love on him until he grows out of it. And, and then he, he says this. Look at verse 7. Very interesting he says, therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Receive one another just like Christ received us. That's an interesting command, isn't it? Now, I think this relates specifically to blowing the trumpet, because this is what I've seen sometimes that happens with people. Someone's in trouble. The trumpet gets blown People nearby hear the sound of the trumpet. They go, man, that's an alarm. And they turn and look and they see and they go, ugh. <laughs> I don't think he's in my family. I'm not sure what family they're in. I've seen this happen a lot where someone clearly is in trouble and they're clearly in need, but they're disheveled. They're, they have crazy eyes. You know? You know what I'm talking about? They, they look like that's going to be a big investment. Or maybe you start to talk to them and you realize, I don't have that energy. I think I, this person is clearly blowing the, the trumpet. They, they clearly are in need, but I, I'm not going to receive them. This is a really interesting thing that Paul says. Look at it again in light of that. Paul says in Romans 15, verse 7, Therefore receive one another, just as Christ received us. Now, what do you think was happening in heaven? Now, we, you know, because you know what the Bible says. We're, we're in Luke. We just saw the angels rejoicing over one sinner who repents. So I know that you know the answer. But think of the day that I went forward to accept Jesus Christ. I had grown up an atheist. I had blasphemed the name of Jesus. I had been drunk three, four days a week from the time I was 13 till the time I was 17, the week before I was at church. I'd been unconscious. I'd, I'd almost died several times in car accidents. I'd had all these things happen. And I went forward and I accepted the Lord. I had never read a Bible in my life. I didn't know what the Bible said. I didn't know who David and Goliath were other than the old claymation Davy and Goliath from the 60s, which I thought was the stupidest thing on TV. And I was always mad when I saw it because that meant a cartoon wasn't on that channel. I thought, what is this hokey show? What is this? I remember hearing the kids in the youth group my first Sunday there, they're talking all about the Bible, and his kids raised in the church, and they knew all this stuff about the Bible. And I sat there thinking, man, I don't know anything. I didn't know anything. I was a complete heathen. And Jesus received me. You know how much baggage I came with? You know how much drama I came with? You know how many things Jesus has had to bail me out of? You know how many sins his blood had to cleanse? You know what it cost him to have me? When Jesus received me, he wasn't getting a present. He was getting a curse. <laughs> he wasn't getting like a, a prized pupil. He was getting a derelict. One of the things I struggle, and this is maybe part of the reason the Lord made me be a pastor, is, is I don't do well listening to people lecture because I think the whole time about how I can disrupt. That was my goal in school. <laughs> when I go to church, like pastor's conference or something, I sit in the front because if I sit in the back, I, I'm imagining having a pea shooter and, you know, shooting people in the audience. And, you know, God wasn't, he didn't, he didn't get anything when he got me. It was a huge risk. He got somebody that could embarrass him totally. He got someone that could drag his name through the mud. He got someone that was going to be so weak that they would need him every single day the rest of their life. He wasn't getting anything when he got me. He received me, though, with open arms, completely, 100%, total love, adopted me into his family, put his name on me, let me, the day, the second I got saved, I could go up to somebody and say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a bleep follower of Jesus Christ. 
I was saved. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to do anything. But that second he received me, he didn't, he didn't look at me and go, uh, no, why don't you try Islam? <laughs> try another religion. Try some other God. I don't want you. Listen, what does Paul say? Paul says, receive each other the way that Jesus received you. That's a heavy commandment. Listen, if the trumpet gets blown, and you, that means somebody's getting it from the enemy. There's a crack in the wall. There's a vulnerability, and you run over there, and you look, and you go, whoa. Well, no, that person doesn't even have a gate. They burned their own gate down. I'm not going to help them. Receive them. Receive them the way Jesus received you. Receive one another just as Christ also received us. That's what it means to love one another the way Jesus loved us. Receive one another the way that Jesus received you. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, one of my favorite verses. I love this verse. So perfect. It's covering one of the most important concepts in our faith in the new covenant, liberty. You've had it. That's the whole book of Galatians is about this liberty. Now Paul's getting to the practical application of liberty. Verse 13, he says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. And I say, yes, amen. I'm called to freedom. I'm not under the law. I'm called to liberty. I can do whatever I want. I've got total perfect liberty. I say, yes. Paul says, you've been called to liberty only. Do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the, for the flesh but through love, serve one another. You got this liberty, now here's what you do with it. You use it to serve each other. You don't have to serve each other. You have the freedom to serve each other. You mean I don't have to serve my wife? You don't have to serve her. Oh, well, then I'm not gonna. No, 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 no. That's not what the liberty's for. The liberty's for, you can come home and you say, honey, guess what? I don't have to do this. But today on the way home from work, here's what I did. I did this, and I didn't even have to. Really? You did that? You didn't have to? Yeah, exactly. Wow. It's not even our anniversary. I know. Well, when is our anniversary again? I mean, will this count for that? I don't have to do this. By love, serve one another. What an awesome thing. Use your liberty not for the flesh. I got freedom. I want to live for my flesh. That's not what the liberty's for. You use your liberty. You see, love requires liberty. Liberty provides the room for love to operate. I'm not required. It's love. It's a labor of love. You can't require a labor of love. Love has to come from a free heart. My heart's free, and I want to love. I'm going to use my freedom to express this love. Serve one another. Serve one another. Jesus said, love one another. Here's how you love each other. Serve each other. Pick up someone else's mess. Follow behind them and pick up, pick up the pieces. Help them hold together. Maybe they're struggling. They blow the trumpet. Run over and serve them. Come over and go, man, you look hungry. Yeah, I threw all my food out. <laughs> well, here, let me help you. You know, you're going to need nutrition. Let me get you something. Let's, let's get you back on track. Let's get back together. Let's make this thing work. Serve one another. Another one, and we'll, this will be the last of, for this, and we'll close in just a couple of minutes. 1 Thessalonians, turn over to there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Again, this is uh, the end of a letter. He's now getting into some, uh, the last part of chapter 5 is this, kind of a list of these very brief exhortations. This kind of begins that section, kind of closes the last section and begins the next section. Verse 11, he says, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you were also doing. When Jesus says love one another, we're kind of filling out that definition. What does that mean? Well, here's what it means. It means receive. Receive one another just as Christ received you. You've got liberty, but use your liberty in, to express love and serve one another. Here's another way of thinking about it. He says comfort each other. You know the word comfort? That's where we're, the word that Jesus used for the Holy Spirit, to call alongside the paraclete. That's, that's a synonym for the Holy Spirit. This is the verb form of that, to comfort 
No, it's not to come over and console and pat somebody. It, it can include that. It means come alongside somebody and help them. You know, someone's carrying a load and they can't carry it. Come over and help them carry it. You know, they blow the trumpet or you're looking, you're, you're trying to be attentive and you say, man, that person needs someone to come alongside and help them. I can think in my life how many times someone has seen me and just voluntarily, without me even knowing I was blowing the trumpet, someone come alongside and help me. Just, just enter into my life. And it's, and it's been at these times in my life from the time when I was saved and till now. The Lord will bring people into my life. It's such a blessing when somebody comforts you. They come right alongside and they help you. They recognize where you're weak and they come along and just help build you up. That's the other word. Edify one another. Build each other up. You know, it's every, anybody, anybody can come and find fault with what someone's doing. But it takes, a, it takes a Christian, someone born again, someone listening to the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, to look and to come along and say, you know what? What you need right here is a two-by-four. And you know what? I got one. And I just cut it to the right length. That'll fit right in there, man. And if you put a bracket there and a bracket there, you can hold up a 1,000 more pounds. I can see your, you know, hey, I got some cinder blocks on my truck. Oh, let's just come in and we'll, I got a bunch of rebar. You know, that's what your cement needs. Let's put a bunch of rebar in there and, man, you'll be solid. Anybody can come along and go, hey, you, did you know you build it with rebar? Huh. What do you think you're going to build over there? Too many people act like that. Come along and just critique what someone else is doing. Comfort one another. Build one another up. Love one another as I have loved you. How does Jesus deal with your weaknesses? Well, he's received you. He had freedom, but in his freedom, he loved you. He served you. He's, he's comforted you. He he's comes alongside to help, and he, he builds you up. That's what we do with each other. When you hear the trumpet, well, listen, that's what our commitment is to each other. And all of this, what we're talking about in Nehemiah, it all comes under one word that's very famous in the New Testament. It's the word fellowship. You know what the word fellowship means? It means to have in common. That's what it means. It's a very simple word, to have in common. Or it could mean to share. When I first got saved, having not raised in the church, our church building was on one side, and then there was a grassy area, and then there was the fellowship hall. I thought the church owned a boat. I thought it was the fellowship. Like, I mean, I'm not joking. I really thought it was a ship. They said, we're going to go to the fellowship hall. And I was like, you guys have a ship? They go, no, it's a building. And I go, well, it's a fellowship. They go, no, 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 it's a fellowship. I'm like, what is a fellowship? Isn't it a ship? No, it's not a boat. It's a building. Okay. Why do you call it a ship? No, fellowship. That's a Christian thing. It means, you know, it's where we have our meals. Or what. I was like, okay, that's weird. And then, I, you know, I didn't know the Bible. I was reading the Bible. like, oh, fellowship. Okay, it's not a boat. I'm serious. I literally had that conversation with somebody. They were looking at me like they did when I said the book of Job. And Malachi, the Italian book in the Bible. <laughs> Fellowship, what does that mean? It means you're going to share. It means you have in common. When the trumpet blows, what do you do? You love. Like if you need, the, if you need help, hey, invest, be intentional, pray for, it, you know, do whatever you need to do. Lord, show me what to do. I've got to have this in my life. This has to happen but on the other side of it, be that person that loves. That the new commandment Jesus gave us to love each other, do that. Receive one another as Christ received us. Serve one another and build each other up and comfort one another. That's what fellowship is. We have, that, we have this in common. I want to encourage you, when you come to church, you know the Lord's working in your life. You come into church, you're coming to get fed, you're, you're wanting to see the God working in your children's life, and you have all the things that you're preoccupied with. Could I just ask you to, to add this thought and put it near the top? Come to share. That's what the fellowship means. Share. Come, come with an open heart. Come with, an, with, with open ears and listen. Did I hear a trumpet? Did I hear someone blowing the trumpet? Because the people that need the help the most... A lot of times, they're too ashamed to even blow the trumpet. You know, Jesus got to look around and go, is that a trumpet in your hand? Were you about to blow? I saw that you hold that up almost. And be 
Be proactive. Be loving. Reach out. Receive somebody the way Christ received you. Comfort them. Come alongside to help them. And you get over there and you see them and you think, messy, big mess. You know, like I do sometimes, I see some of your kids afterwards, you know, they've been eating a donut or something. And I go, where's your mom? <laughs> I'm not your mom. This, this messy, my kids grew up. I, I don't have to wipe them like that anymore. Like here, this thing, he's yours. I think, you know, sometimes there's people that are messy after the service and, and everybody will just walk, you know, maybe, maybe just walk around them. How, how is that fellowship? Fellowship means to have in common. What do we have in common? I should change that. Who do we have in common? What's the common? Who is the common denominator? Jesus. He's the equalizer. It's Jesus. I see that person, I see Jesus. I treat that person like I'd, I'd want Jesus to treat, like how Jesus treats him, how I would treat Jesus. It's all about the Lord. So share something with someone. Make it your aim to share something with someone every time you come to church. To say, I'm not going to change the whole world, Lord, but at least every time I go to church, I'm going to find somebody that I can give something to, that I could share something with, that I, that I, would, I would get out of my comfort zone, and I wouldn't just... I mean, I'm not saying you don't want to be fed, and obviously that's, that's important. I'm not, don't diminish that. But the early church, Acts 2.42, our model for ministry, they devoted themselves steadfastly to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The love gets expressed in, under that word fellowship. That's where we love each other. That's where we look for people, and we find them, and we say, hey, man, it looks like the enemy broke through. Can I help you? I got a bunch of supplies. Looks like... Looks like you had a leak. <laughs> I've got plaster. You know, I got a bunch of green board at home and, it, and I got it in storage. I could bring it over. Let me help you. Let me help you. Let me come alongside and help you. So, Lord, we pray for, for the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you want to do a work in our lives and we need it, Lord. And I, this is just very specific, very direct tonight. And so we just pray for help. Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray, we pray that our love would abound with real knowledge and all discernment. Lord, we know your love was always very discerning. When the rich young ruler went away sad, you didn't chase after him. You know, the, the Pharisees, you rebuked them soundly. Even when they were so angry they were going to kill you, you, you spoke the truth in love. And so, Lord, we're not asking for something out of balance, but Jesus, you died on the cross. You received us. You loved us. You comfort us. You strengthen us. You build us up. And, and we're exhorted and commanded to do the same. And just looking at this passage in Nehemiah of, of the necessity of, uh, to, the, the work spreading us out. And so just so imperative for us to stick together because we're far apart because the work is great. It's awesome. So diverse. So it's, it's especially necessary for us to be committed to one another. So Lord, put that in our hearts. Inspire that. I pray that we would we would be exploding with love. That we would find ourselves so excited to come and hear from you, to worship you in song and, and hear your word and humble our hearts and receive and be built up. But Lord, also that other dynamic of coming to give something away, coming to share, coming with something. Even if we think well, we only have just the one thing, Lord, help us to love one another. Help us, Lord. And, and, and Lord, even if someone's in trouble, may they blow the trumpet. Help us, to, help us to be willing to open up and say, man, I'm struggling. Help us to be, be ready to confess our sins to each other and be ready to pray for each other that we'll be healed. Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.